this is Lady Boulay, and I hope you're having a wonderful day. I hope this moment finds you in the very best of spirits and the very best of health. When we think about the whole history of slavery, we often think about the really hardships and the pain and the separations and the agony of the whole thing. We rarely think of it in a humorous fashion because in truth, we can't look back on it and find anything humorous. But once in a while, you'll come across something and it will absolutely blow your mind and then you almost have to laugh because it's just a funny moment. The guts that a person would have to have, the risk that they would have to take, the chance and the confidence that you would have to have to actually escape from slavery is remarkable. But as strange as it might seem, many of the enslaved did very daring things. They did things that you wouldn't think about. They say fact is stranger than fiction. Well, in some cases, that's really true. Even now, looking back, you wonder, where did they get the courage to do such things? But their backs were against the wall. And many of them decided that I'm going to take this chance, and if I die, I die. But I want to be free. Henry Box Brown was one such person, and he is the first one featured in the series Daring Acts of the Enslaved. What Henry Box Brown did was so amazing that you just have to shake your head and laugh. And the title of today's video is The Man Who Mailed Himself to Freedom. You heard right. He mailed himself to freedom. Henry Brown was born in Louisa County, Virginia on the Hermitage Plantation in 1815 or 16. So he was born in the thick of it. Virginia did not offer many outlets for an enslaved person who had a mind to escape. Although you had better chance maybe than somebody in Alabama or Mississippi, but it still was a hard task. In 1815, the state of West Virginia had not been formed yet, so Virginia actually bordered Ohio, which was a free state. There was Washington, D.C., and then Pennsylvania nearby. And for an enslaved person, those places must have seemed like paradise. So those living in states that bordered free states more often escaped out of the system than those living in the Deep South where they had to go through two or three states to get to a free state. Interestingly enough, after his escape, Henry Brown spoke very well of his enslaver or his slave master, as we used to say. He said he was a very kind person. He even went as far to say that the slave master was like a god to them. Nevertheless, he was a slave, and that man could decide whether he lived, died, or were sold. He married an enslaved woman from another plantation, and they had three children. He worked in a tobacco factory, and his slave master, and I say that for convenience, we realize that they were enslaved, but for the convenience of this video, his slave master allowed him to pay his wife's slave master with the promise that he wouldn't sell Henry Brown's wife and children. The man went back on his word and sold his wife and children to another plantation. I suppose it was devastating to him to realize that he didn't have any control and that he couldn't trust a man to keep his word. So Henry Brown began to plan his escape. The Hermitage Plantation was near Richmond, Virginia, and Henry Brown apparently was able to move around a little bit and have a degree of autonomy. He made friends with a free black man and a sympathetic white man who was a shoemaker and through his association with them, he came up with the elaborate plan of having himself shipped in a box to a free state. And they agreed to help him. James Smith was the free black man that was his friend and he went to Philadelphia to consult with members of the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society to discuss what was the best way to accomplish this escape. 
They advised him to mail the box to Passmore Williamson, who was a Quaker merchant and who was also active in the anti-slavery movement. To get out of work on the day that he was supposed to escape, he intentionally burned his hand to the bone with sulfuric acid. Now, that's an act of desperation. I think we can all agree. He met his two friends at the agreed upon destination and they packed him in the box. It was about three by two by three feet. And they had displayed on the box right side up. It was lined with base coarse wooden cloth and he carried a small portion of water and a few biscuits. There was a single hole cut for air and it was nailed and tied with straps. They took him to the Adams Express Company and he was put on board. His trip began on March 29, 1849. And it was eventful to say the least. He was transported by wagon, railroad, steamboat, wagon again, railroad, ferry, railroad, and finally he was delivered to his destination and it took 27 hours. He said, despite the instructions on the box of handle with care and this side up, several times the carriers placed the box upside down or handled it roughly. In spite of that, he remained silent and avoided detection. At journey's end, he said, despite the risk, it was worth it because if you have never been deprived of your freedom, as I was, you cannot realize the power of that hope of freedom, which was to me indeed an anchor to the soul, both sure and steadfast. So he was successfully delivered to Passamore Williamson and other members of the anti-slavery movement on March the 30th, 1849. They say when he opened the box, they opened the box, he got out and said, how do you do, gentlemen? And he began singing a psalm from the Bible that he had chosen to sing once he was released into freedom. So in addition to crediting this man with an inventive mind, we could also say that the United States Mail Delivery Service was working pretty well in 1849 if they could deliver someone out of slavery into freedom. Henry Brown was obviously a small man, but still, kudos to the United States Postal Service. One of the things that the abolitionists and those who worked in the anti-slavery movement asked of those that they helped out of slavery was that they would go on the speaking circuit and speak to the audiences in the North about the horrors of slavery. So Henry Brown, who is now being called Henry Box Brown because he boxed his way out of slavery, went on the speaking circuit and he actually told how he had escaped from slavery. Frederick Douglass, who was very active in the abolitionist movement, took issue with the fact that he was telling how he had escaped from slavery because he thought that was a genius means for other enslaved people to escape. When Henry Box Brown became something of a showman, he liked telling the story, and he continued telling it. He went on it as far as to suggest, you know, give advice about how to end slavery, saying that a new president should be elected and the North should speak out against the South. And, um, you know, it took some years, but that actually happened. Even in the days of slavery, word got around. So the word got back down south that Henry Brown had escaped from slavery. Now his wife's slave master appeals to him through the newspapers that his wife and children are for sale and encouraged him to come back to the south to buy his wife and children. Frederick Douglass and the abolitionists encouraged him to do it. But he would not do it. Most likely he knew what he was dealing with, that it was a trick. So he refused to go back. He was out and he had no intention of going back into slavery, not even for what would most likely turn out to be a trick in which he would end up back in slavery. Slave owning was big business. Those enslaved were generating 
massive amounts of income for the economy. So for slaves to start escaping, and that was starting to happen more and more, something had to be done. So one year after Henry Brown escaped in 1850, Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Law. This meant that those who had escaped from slavery could be tracked down and brought back into slavery. People like Henry Brown, these high-profile cases who, who really used their wits and outsmarted the system, were heavy targets. So Henry Brown realized that he had to get out of Dodge. So he went to England. In England, Henry Brown reinvented himself. The British had a fascination with American slavery. So anybody that escaped from slavery and ended up in England, in London, became an instant celebrity. So Henry Brown basically became a sought after speaker and he became an actor and he called himself the African Prince and Professor H. Box Brown. So he really just became a ham for the public, really. He married an English woman and they had children as well. Slavery ended in 1865. In 1875, Henry Brown returned to the United States with his family. He continued his show business career. He even formed a family singer group that they called the Brown Jubilee Singers. From all indication, he was a versatile performer, singing, acting, and doing the magic show. Henry Brown was living his best life. As interesting and fascinating as the story was, I will say that my opinion of Henry Brown is that he was a very selfish man. He did not reconnect with his ex-wife and three children that he had before he escaped. And the two men that had helped him were actually arrested trying to help other slaves or enslaved people to escape. And there is no record that Henry Brown ever tried to help anybody else out of slavery, not even his own family. He eventually moved his family to Toronto, Canada, where he continued his show business career, singing, acting, and doing his magic show. He died in Toronto on June 15, 1897. This is a true story. I hope you enjoyed it. And let me know what you think. Subscribe, give me a thumbs up, and share the video with someone you think might like it. And have a good day.